Good morning and welcome to Church Online. We're so glad that you've joined us today. If you're new, you can text the number on the screen and we'd love to reach out and just say thanks. I'm so excited for what God has in store today. Let's dive in. Hey, what's up? My name is Chris Highfield, lead pastor here at Grace River Church, and I want to say thank you so much for watching online at home today. Today we start a brand new series called Unstoppable. Uh, we're talking about what happened uh, in the early church after the resurrection. And so we're a week after Easter, what happens next? But we're also going to take that same transferable truth about what happened after Easter and apply it to the church today, because here's the thing, you are the church. In fact, something that we say all the time at Grace River is the church is not a building you drive to. It's a movement that you choose to be a part of, a movement that's helping people meet, know, and follow Jesus. So the church is not about a building. In fact, uh, in the New Testament, the church is never addressed as a building. It's always addressed as a group of people. In fact, just to define the church, the church is made up of Christians, but we're here for everyone else. So if you want a good definition of the church. The church is you. If you follow Jesus, you are the church. That's why during COVID, we talked about the fact that we're never canceling church because you are the church. There's no way to actually shut the church down. The church is unstoppable. And so it doesn't matter if it's a pandemic. It doesn't matter if it's a tragedy. It doesn't matter what the difficulty is. Hey, listen to me. You are the church. And so uh, that's a big shift, though, because oftentimes in our minds, we think, oh, the church has to be about a building. Our church started uh, nine years ago, and we met, uh, we've met really in four different locations. We started in my living room, and we were a church, even though we didn't have a building. Uh, we met at an elementary school. We were a church, even though we didn't have a building. Uh, and then we met at a YMCA for four years. Uh, and it was all those places were great. Uh, but the reality is uh, there's something that happened whenever we got into a building that made us feel like a church, but we were a church the entire time because again, the church is not a building you drive to. The church is a movement that you choose to be a part of. And uh, we're going to be in the book of Acts for this series. It's a three-week series. And my encouragement to you is to catch all three weeks of this series. In fact, my big encouragement to you is to come join us in person for one of these three weeks because I really believe uh, that you can get more out of this in an in-person scenario uh, than online. And so Let's jump into this today. My hope and my prayer is that you take a next step on your spiritual journey as you meet, know, and follow Jesus. So uh, Acts is where we're going to start this series in. In fact, we're going to stay in the book of Acts. Acts was written by one of the 12 disciples, Luke. So really, it's just Luke's like second book. Uh, and Luke has details that other disciples don't have because he's more educated than the rest of the disciples. And so we're going to jump into this and we're going to start with some of the last things or really the last thing that Jesus says to his disciples after he resurrects uh, and before he ascends to heaven. So a little background on the person of Jesus. Jesus was born. Uh, we celebrate that birth at Christmas, right? Uh, and then uh, he lives a, a perfect life. He does healings and teachings and miracles. He serves the poor and the, the least of these uh, he, he, he preaches and teaches to educated and uneducated, and he changes the world. And then he dies on a cross on a Friday and borrows a tomb uh, Friday, Saturday, and resurrects on the third day on Sunday. And then he spends, after he resurrects, he spends 40 days teaching and meeting with his disciples and inspiring them to take next steps as they, as they turn the world upside down. And so Acts chapter 1, verse 8 is the, some of the last words that Jesus says to the disciples. And here's what he says to them. He says, he says this, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, uh, throughout Judea, Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. There, there's some really key things that Jesus says to them. First of all, he says, Hey, I'm leaving, but you're going to receive power from the Holy Spirit. So, the same power that resurrects Jesus from the grave is now going to live inside of anyone who's following Jesus. And so, and then he says, you're going to be my witnesses. So you're going to tell the story. When you're a witness, what you're doing is you're telling the story about what God did. So imagine if you witnessed a car wreck, right? Or you witnessed a fight at work, or you witnessed some great play happening with the Cardinals, right? Like if you witness something your vantage point would be told. You would talk about where you were at when the accident happened. You would talk about the cubicle you were sitting in when the fight 
broke out. You would talk about uh, the seat that you had in the stands if you were at a Cardinals game and there was a Grand Slam home run. You would be a witness of this event and you would talk about your vantage point of it. Now, here's the thing. You, although you and I did not witness the death of Jesus and we did not witness the resurrection of Jesus, we are witnesses because our lives have been changed as a result of the death and the resurrection of Jesus. So he says this to them, you'll be my witnesses and you're going to tell people everywhere. So this is really important. Everywhere is all over the place, everywhere. And then he gets more descriptive. He says really in three places, in Jerusalem, which was the city that they lived in. And so you think about us and the importance of St. Charles County, man, that's our version of Jerusalem, that we will be witnesses, that we will tell people at the grocery store, okay? Uh, that we'll talk to our neighbors and our coworkers, people that we're family with, familiar with, people that we're friends with. We'll do that. That's our Jerusalem. And then throughout Judea, that would be more of like a local, like a, like a localized like Missouri or Illinois, like regionally. And we do that through church planting. And so we're helping start brand new churches all over the region, right, in, in, in Judea. And then there's Samaria, which is nationally. And again, uh, we're, we're spreading the name of Jesus nationally by planting brand new churches all over the nation with our network that we're a part of called Converge. And then also to the ends of the earth. And so this is internationally with missions and we support missionaries as a church uh, to not only reach people in America, but to reach them all over the globe. And so that is the marching orders that Jesus gives to the disciples that they will be witnesses spreading the name of Jesus literally across the street and around the world. And so that's really important. And ultimately to be unstoppable, <laughs> which is the whole point of the series, to be unstoppable, it means that we're going to have full devotion to the God who was fully devoted to you. So full devotion to a God who's fully devoted to you. So the, the point of this series is for us to move out of a circumstantial or even a consumeristic faith and instead move into the kind of faith that says, I will lay down my life for this God who laid down his life for me. In fact, Jesus says this in John chapter 17, verse nine, and I give myself as a holy sacrifice for them so they can be made holy by your truth. Jesus is praying and he's talking to God the Father and he says, hey, I am willing to devote myself, to sacrifice myself. That's This word sacrifice is the same word as devotion, which just simply means this, to lay it down. I'm willing to lay down my life so that these people can know the truth. And that's what Jesus did for us. So it's only reasonable, listen to me, it's only reasonable that you would give your life back to the same God who gave you his life. So Acts chapter two, we talked about Acts chapter one, the last thing Jesus says after the resurrection. Now in Acts chapter two, Peter, the same disciple that denied Jesus. So if you've got a past, I need you to understand something. God will use you, okay? Uh, Peter was the same guy that denied even knowing Jesus. And so like, it's amazing what God did in Peter's life after Peter repents, has this big heart change, sees a resurrected Jesus, all of a sudden he goes from coward to courageous and he's unstoppable as a result of it. In fact, the, the other disciples and apostles become unstoppable as well. They are even willing to go uh, to their graves as a result of following Jesus. And, and they're, they're saying, hey, we're gonna be fully devoted to this God who was fully devoted to us. So Acts chapter two, uh, Peter is preaching at what's known as the day of Pentecost. So he's there and there are thousands and thousands of people listening to what Peter has to say. And what's amazing about this worship service was it wasn't that they had killer music. It wasn't that Peter was an amazing speaker and eloquent. It wasn't that they had haze or the fog machine was working just right or the lighting was right. It wasn't about any of that. There was a powerful thing happening it was the Holy Spirit moving in people's lives here in Acts chapter 2. Let's just read this. Then Peter continued preaching. I love this. I love the detail uh, that Luke gives here. Again, back to details on Luke. He says, for a long time. I think that's awesome. Uh, and so I often use this whenever people complain that I preach too long because I honestly don't preach all that long. But for a long time, strongly urging all of his listeners, he says this, save yourselves from this crooked generation. And so he's pleading with them like, Listen, it's not a, he's trying to explain to them, it's not about religion. It's about this relationship with God. And Peter's really saying, God can dwell in you, that it's not about going to a temple and worshiping anymore. He's really saying the church is you, that God is calling you, that God chose you. And, 
And Peter would say the same thing to you today, and I would say the same thing to you today. It's not about a building you drive to. God can dwell in you. Don't make it about what a crooked generation makes it. I, th I believe there's a crooked generation out there, by the way, that is making religion about a building or making religion about getting your act together. And he, he says this, man, save yourselves from this crooked generation. And those who believed, verse 41, those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church about 3,000 in all that day. That's amazing. 3,000 people say yes to Jesus that day. I mean, it, it's, it's amazing really to think about. And then in verse 42, all the believers, this is really important, devoted themselves. Again, the word devotion means to lay your life down. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, which they, they had friendship, they had connection, uh, and, and, to sh and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper and prayer. And so, man, they met together regularly, okay? Uh, they prayed together, they ate together, they shared meals together, they did all of these things, and they also prayed together. And a deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonder, man, they, they were doing church, but they weren't just doing church, okay? Uh, they, they were living the church. And then in verse 44, and all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. We're going to talk about this in coming weeks during this series. Then in verse 46, they worshiped together and they worshiped together at the temple each day. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper and they shared their meals with great joy and generosity. Man, they were loving this life they had together. Um, then in verse 47, and while they were praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people, and each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who are being saved. What's amazing is the church is unified, but it's also expanding at this rapid rate. Let's just kind of review what happened in the early church. First of all, at the resurrection, at the time of the resurrection, there's about 120 people that were following Jesus. Yeah. At the cross and pre-resurrection, that's the number. And then 3,000 people are added a week after. This day that Peter preaches, we just learned about that, 3,000 people are added to this movement. So now they're 3,120. And then a few days later after that, 2,000 people are added to the church. So what made this church so attractive? What made this church unstoppable? Listen to me. It wasn't about a building. And it wasn't about killer worship and killer preaching. What it was about was this, this thing that had happened inside of all of their hearts. They were living a changed, fully devoted life. It wasn't halfway devoted. They wouldn't go to church just when they felt like it or when it fit their schedule. They wouldn't, they, they wouldn't uh, lay down their lives for Jesus just whenever things were working out great in their circumstances. Like they laid down their lives regardless what was happening. And so it wasn't about preaching great things. It was about living great things. They were living out what, the, what Jesus had asked them to do. And I think that's what God wants us to do today, is to just live out this good news, to live out this new life, to live out this devoted life. You may wonder, man, I look at other Christians or other people that are following God, and I, I see all they have, and why don't I have this? And here's my question, here's my, my thought to you, maybe... Maybe it's because you're only living halfway devoted. For you to really experience God, you have to live a fully devoted life towards Him. Second Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9. God's looking for people like this, by the way. The eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to Him. This is an Old Testament prophet telling someone like the importance of like understanding that you need to live a life fully committed to Him. Like, like a heart that is committed to him. You know, a devoted follower of Christ really loves God in, in, in some different areas, okay? A fully devoted follower of Christ is someone who loves God with all their heart, their soul, their mind, and their strength, and also loves others the same way Jesus loves them. I think sometimes we make being fully devoted complicated. Well, man, if I'm fully devoted, that means I have to do this, 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 and this. No, full devotion to God just simply means this, loving God, and loving people. Let's look at it. John chapter 13, Jesus talks about this. So now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. So listen, you can't love God and hate people at the same time, okay? Like if I really say that I love God, 
then I am going to love people as well. And so that's the, the second part of the important piece of being fully devoted. Full devotion means I'm going to love others, but I'm also, it also has to start with me loving God. So Mark chapter 12, verse 29, Jesus replied, the most important commandment is this. Listen, O Israel, the Lord our God is the one and only Lord. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all of your strength. And then the second is equally important. Mark 12, verse 31, is love your neighbor as yourself. No other command is greater than these. So fully devoted to God. And you know, Mark lists, Jesus in, in Mark's gospel lists these four things. To your like full devotion is heart, soul, mind, and strength. So how do you do that? Okay, heart is this. Do you desire God? Like if I'm going to be fully devoted to him, it means that my heart has to be about desiring him first. In fact, when I desire him first, he gives me everything I need. The book of Proverbs says that. That if I make God the delight and the desire of my heart, that God will give me everything that I need. Now, not everything that you want, everything that you need, but it starts with desiring God first. But there's also this soul piece, which is, okay, so in my heart, but also in my soul that I'm trusting him. Now, there are probably some circumstances in your life that aren't ideal right now. I, in fact, I would say every single one of us have something that we're like, man, I, I wish this could change, or I wish this could be different, or if I had full control of the situation, I would change it and make it like this. If I was able to, to pull the levers and just control everything in my life, it may be something in your marriage or maybe something with your kids, maybe something financially, something relationally, something at work. Like, do you trust God? A fully devoted follower says, hey, my, I, my circumstances may not be ideal, but I'm going to trust him through it. That's what full devotion looks like. But then there's also the mind of actually knowing God, not just knowing facts about him, but actually knowing him. And maybe you've never made that step. Like you can't fully love God if you don't really know him. You can know about him, but do you actually know him? And then there's also strength that you would serve God, like that I, that I would take everything that God has given me, all the strength, all the energy that he's given me, and I would lay my life down fully devoted to him and say, God, it's all yours. I'm giving you everything and I'm serving you with everything. Here's the thing. My hope and my desire for you is that you would live in unstoppable faith. The church will only be as strong as the people that make it up. So you can complain about the church and gripe about the church, but here's the thing. You are the church and Unless you're willing to give all of yourself back to the same God who gave you his life, there is going to be an emptiness in your life, an incompleteness in your life. You will feel stoppable. But to be unstoppable, it means I'm giving all of myself back to this God who gave me his life. What did that early church do? The early church had full devotion. They were doing this. It was heart. It was soul. It was mind. It was strength. They were saying, hey, it's all of yours, God. And I wonder, are you willing to do that? If you're willing to do that, I think there's some next steps that you need to consider. The first one is this, is that when you fully devote yourself to God, like fully, like, okay, this is it, I'm doing it. Here's the thing, Christianity is not a safe faith. Think about the logo, it's a cross. What other organization has a logo that means you're gonna die? Like, you think about that. Full devotion means I'm not playing it safe. I'm fully devoting myself to him because I know that's the best way to live my life. Also, decide what step that you're going to take. Like, I believe that you know what your next step is. Your next step may be baptism. In a few weeks on April 21st, we're baptizing. And you may think, that that's my next step. In fact, in the link below, you can register today to get baptized. If you haven't done that in your adult life, like maybe your parents baptized you as an infant, and I think that's awesome because they were dedicating you back to God, but Reality is, you know it, I know it. It's time for you to go public with your faith. God's not going to give you more to be disobedient with until you're obedient with this first thing, which is baptism. But maybe it's laying down an addiction. Maybe that's your next step. Maybe it's joining a small group. Maybe it's finding a, a, a team to serve on here at church. Maybe it's giving back to God financially. You know you haven't been doing that and you know that you need to. Like, What next step do you need to take? Decide what it is and actually have the courage. You have clarity now. So now my hope and my prayer is that you have courage to actually take that step. And then love the same way that Jesus loved. We didn't talk much about that in this sermon, but the reality is, is that like Jesus said, love God, 
love others. And maybe there's an incompleteness there for you that you're not loving God and you're not loving others. And there's something broken there. And you've got to fix that to go, okay, I've been forgiven. So now I can go forgive others. I've been loved. So now I can even love the unlovely. Loving people is a challenging thing because sometimes it means loving people that are different than you. Loving people that it's going to be a bit of a task. It's going to be some work. Uh, it's not going to necessarily improve your life uh, on the front end of it anyways. Uh, but man, when you love, despite the circumstances, despite the person, despite what they've done or despite what you've done, it's amazing what God does in your life. But maybe in order for you to fully devote yourself for God, maybe you need to give yourself to God for the very first time. Maybe you've never taken that step. I want to pray with you right now and give you the opportunity to say yes to him, to say, God, I've been living my life partially devoted to you, not fully devoted, and it's because you've never made Jesus the Lord and the Savior of your life. If you need to do that right now, you can pray a prayer just like this. God, I'm sorry for what I've made my life about. And God, I believe that you sent your only sons so that you could lay your life down so I could be with you forever. So God, in this moment, Help me to lay my life down. God, I'm giving up my rights to call the shots and I'm declaring you to be the Lord of my life for the very first time. So God, today I confess that your son Jesus is my Lord and my Savior. Thank you for saving me and for changing me. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Man, if you just prayed that prayer, I just wanna encourage you, way to go, you're awesome. If you could text the word yes to the number on the screen, 636-336-2475. That's the word yes to 636-336-2475. We would love to be able to help you take some next steps as you meet, know, and follow Jesus and just celebrate with you, give you a high five, uh, and help you take some of those big, big, big next steps. Again, uh, a big next step that we can all, that all of us can take is baptism on April 21st. If you've never been baptized, this is a great next step for you to take. Uh, we've got around 20 people already registered for baptism. It's going to be bananas, and I hope that you can make it uh, and celebrate with us. And so uh, thank you so much for watching online at home today. Man, God sent his only son to die on a cross for you so that you could be unstoppable, that no matter what you're up against, no matter what the difficulties is, no matter what the valley is in your life, uh, you can get through this, not because you're awesome, but because God is. God bless you. Can't wait to see you back at Grace River Church next week. Thanks. I hope that you are encouraged by what you heard today. Here at Grace River, we believe that it's important to give back to the God who has given us everything. If you feel inclined to give, I'd like to give you that opportunity now. You can do so by texting Grace River to the number on the screen. And lastly, I'd like to personally invite you to one of our three in-person services every single Sunday at 8.30, 9.45, and 11 a.m. That's it for today. We hope to see you soon.